All right, can folks hear me in the back? Uh, I, I tell them that uh, if you've ever heard me speak, I normally don't need a microphone. My voice tends to carry, but uh, I know the, this room, the acoustics, so I, I, I gave in and I'm wearing the microphone, so I just want to make sure you can hear me clearly. Well, um, if you walked in, it's a little brisk outside. Uh, that wind, uh, it's a bit bracing. The ambient temperature, I think, is about 28 degrees. That's not too bad, but that wind, it's really cold out there. Uh, contrast that with South Africa, where they, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's currently summertime. And people are enjoying 72 degree temperatures in Cape Town and about 80 degrees in the capital in Pretoria. So uh, life's a little different on the other side of the world right now. Well, thank you kindly for uh, that kind introduction. Uh, I do have a, a fair amount of experience on the continent, and I do tend to talk fast. So if I get too fast, just kind of raise your hand and, or do this like slow down sort of thing, okay? Uh, I, I get kind of excited. I'm very enthusiastic about Africa and South Africa in particular, which was my first love in Africa. Another thing is I like to connect with the audience, so if I walk amongst you, I, I'm, it's not because I'm a Lutheran minister, it's just because I like to... <laughs> I, like, I see some Lutherans in the crowd, uh, so I just like to connect with the audience, so uh, anyway. Also, when I prepared this, uh, I'm accustomed to taking questions as I go, but I understand that we, we want to do the presentation and then take questions, so uh, I'll try to adjust now because uh, I was preparing for a different approach. So my experience in Africa, serving the Army, I've served in those places. Let's see if I can run through the list. I worked at the National Security Agency, where I worked on Africa, then the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I ended at the Pentagon at the same time on Africa. Then I was in Liberia, uh, Botswana, Malawi, Niger, Mauritania, Uganda, and finally Ethiopia. And in the middle of all that, I did a tour at the Africa Command after it was created up in Germany. So I've, I've, I've been around a few places. So. I've also been on temporary assignments at over 35 of the 54 countries in Africa, so I've seen most of it. A few places I haven't been are the Congo, and I'm not in a rush to get there, uh, <laughs> if you know anything about the Congo. All right, so um, I'm a little reticent about the title of this topic. It's South Africa's Fragile Democracy. Here's the thing. If you're an Africanist, like myself, and you talk about Africa, it's very easy to start talking about all the challenges and all the problems and all the things that people think are wrong or going badly. There's actually a lot of good things happening in Africa and in South Africa. But I'm not going to talk about much of that today, unfortunately. So I didn't want to depress you. So with that, um, uh, if I could get the video, just a brief video here for everybody to listen to. switch back to, the, uh, to the, the slides. All right, why did I show that? Well, for a lot of reasons. Number one, because a lot of what I'm going to talk about is not the best news, so I want to hopefully put you in a better mood. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty inspired by that. That is South Africa's national anthem. 
And for those who didn't see the bottom corner, that is the opening ceremony for the 2010 soccer right, World Cup in South Africa, or as most people around the world call it, football. Uh, but come to America, we set them straight. It's soccer. <laughs> Which, little known fact, is the original name for the game created by the British. And they called it soccer until the 1960s when they abandoned it and started calling it football like the rest of the world. And then the Brits looked down their nose at us because we're, we're a bunch of bumpkins because we call it soccer. But anyway, little side note. So um, the thing about that anthem is that it is an anthem that came from the original score. The music was played during the racist apartheid regime. They had the same song. Just all the lyrics were in Afrikaans. Today the lyrics are in several languages. It's a multilingual national anthem. You'll hear Kosa, Zulu, Afrikaans, and English in the anthem. And that's an important thing, because that was an effort at reconciliation. Uh, this is not going to be a discussion of the long history of South Africa, although I'll have to talk a little bit about it just to frame things. It's going to be mostly a concentration on what's happened since 1994 and moving on. So also on a good note, if you look up here on that photograph, uh, anybody recognize that? You want to know where it's at? Cape Town, yeah, off the Cape of Good Hope. That's where the Dutch landed in 1652 and established a refit and rest station so that their, so their sailors wouldn't get scurvy. They'd eat fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and things like that. And where Europeans first came into major conflict and, and contact with Africans in southern, uh, South Africa. There's a picture up here of uh, a different group of South Africans. You can see that South Africa people come from many different races and different ethnic origins and speak many languages, as we'll discuss. So, I don't know if you remember this commercial, and this is important, I think, to set the framework. As Americans, most of us in here are Americans, there's a few who aren't, but most of us as Americans, when we think of a democracy or a republic, we have a particular perception, right? The way we do things. The way we go, where people run for office, how people get elected, and how our government is organized. Well, South Africa's democracy is not your father's Oldsmobile. You remember that commercial? Yeah, me too. So I thought that that would be appropriate to call it that. So, it's not what many of us know or understand as a democracy. Does that mean it's not a democracy? Of course not, it is a democracy. People get to vote and their vote makes a difference and they elect governments. But the way they do it is a little bit different than the way we do it. And when we question or judge how South, African do, South Africans do things, it's important to understand that it may be because of the structure of the system. And so that will be a part of this discussion. First off, South Africa has three national capitals. The last time I checked, we have one. It seems to be getting more influential by the day, and as more and more businesses put all their headquarters around Washington so they can be close to the seat of power. But South Africa has three. Cape Town, which is the legislative capital and where the parliament sits. Then there's Pretoria, which is the administrative or executive capital, and the government actually runs out of there. The national government is run from Pretoria, or as it's called today, Shwana. The name has been changed, but for the world, they still leave the, a small part of this town is called Pretoria so that Embassies don't have to change their addresses and people don't get confused. And then the third capital is Bloemfontein, which came from Dutch as an Afrikaans word, which means blooming fountain. It's in the middle of a very dry area, and so there was a spring there, and they named it after that. Bloemfontein is um, the judicial capital. So three capitals. That in itself is different and unique. I don't know of any country around the world that does that. Also, this is a result of the apartheid era. The apartheid government had these three capitals. When the all-race selections took place and majority government came in under the African National Congress. They retained these capitals. And many of the structures that still existed today are antecedent roots, their antecedent roots come from apartheid era South Africa. So there are three levels of governance similar to the United States, uh, although we have a few other layers if you look at townships and things like that. But South Africa has national government, provincial governments, or states, if you will, and then local municipalities. Now, the municipalities are interesting because at the end of apartheid in 1994, the official date, there were approximately 2,000 municipalities around the country with city councils and mayors and things like that. Uh, they built a new constitution, and that was refined. The number was reduced, and ultimately today, that number is actually lower. I just looked. It's conflicting information. There are probably about 235 municipalities. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you are from an opposition party or a small party that's ethnically based and you come from a small town where you run for office and there's 3,000 voters, you only have to win a majority of 3,000, your party gets elected and you get experience governing as a mayor or a city councilor. 
But if that small town is absorbed into Johannesburg, where your 3,000 votes don't matter in a city of 4 million people, then your opposition party is not going to get that experience. And that also plays a role. And so the ANC has had the lion's share of government positions across all three levels of governance since 1994. That in itself creates a challenge for South Africa. So when you run for the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania, you go register. Hopefully you're not a criminal, so you stay on the list. You run for office. Some become criminals after they get in office. Uh, you run for office. I, I didn't say that. Uh, did you turn off the recording? So uh, <clears throat> in South Africa, voters don't vote for the members of parliament. What do I mean by that? Well, if you want to run for office, you don't go register for office. Your party selects who will get the positions. You as voters go to the poll and you have a choice. The registered political parties are listed. You vote for a party, not for a candidate. Think about that for a second. If you like Trump or you didn't like Trump, it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't be voting for Trump. You'd be voting for the Republican Party, the Libertarian Party, the American Communist Party. They're still around, by the way. There's not many of them left. Or the Democrats or whoever the party is. You would not vote for the candidate. Think about the impact of that. So what that means is that if the ANC wins 60% of the electorate, they get 60% of the seats in Parliament. And they choose who serves where. Now, does that matter? Put this in context. I presume that most of you are either from Pennsylvania or you live here now, of course. So if you are from California, I suspect that you may have different thoughts or values, even though we're all Americans, about how you address your local government. But what if you voted in the election this fall or next fall, and you voted for your party, and the person that represents you comes from Oregon and moves here and represents you? Who do you think they're going to respond to, you as the voter or the party that put them there? Think about that. So that's a challenge. This is what's known as a party list of proportional representation. Very different than our system. Very much a parliamentary system. And then South Africa's government's a little strange because it's a mix of parliamentary with some systems similar to ours. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit as we go forward. So they have a bicameral legislature, like we do, House of Representatives and the Senate. They have the National Assembly, which is what we normally think of for South Africa's parliament, which has 400 members in the National Assembly. And the National Council of Provinces, which, similar to our Senate, is the upper house. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't get as much attention. It only has 90 members. South Africa has also had some interesting things under its constitution. By the way, if, if, if you've read our constitution, it's, it's pretty succinct. It's rather short, isn't it? The United States Constitution doesn't take a long time to read, unless you're really trying to read slowly. South African Constitution is 176 pages long. It's considered by most analysts around the world to be the most liberal constitution on the planet. It enshrines rights for all sorts of things and all sorts of people. And it is considered by many to be the most fair and most comprehensive constitution. But I will tell you that I can't profess to be an expert on it. I'd have to refer to it because I can't remember 176 pages of anything, let alone dry legislative things. But there are some things that take place in South Africa which have an impact on their democracy. Now, this is no longer in place, but it had a role in ensuring the composition of the parliament until 2009. It was known as the floor crossing exercise. Now, think about this. This is important because we talked about the parliament or the, the party list and selecting people based on proportional representation. So in the early part of the odd decade, or you know, the, after the turn of the century there, uh, a, a opposition party asked because they were merging with some other opposition parties and they wanted to be able to form a block. Prior to this law that was put in place, if they merged, they would lose their seats in parliament because someone would leave one party and join another party, if you're following me. So let's say you're, you're green and you're red, and because you're opposition party, you want to merge after election, you do that, well, you'd have to give up all the seats on one side. So the, the minority parties ask for an exception to this, and they passed legislation that allowed for floor crossing. And what the floor crossing meant was that at, during a two-week period in every parliamentary session, any member of any political party could change political parties. So if you were in the National Party at the time or the Democratic Alliance, you could join the ANC or vice versa. So think about this for a second. If you're the party in power and you hold the keys to governance and you run the budgets and ministers and deputy ministers uh, get luxury BMWs and Mercedes as a perk of their job, housing allowances and staffs. If you're the ruling party and you want to up your members of parliament, what might a neat tactic be? 
offer something like that to people from the opposition party. Now, that's people do the, in government. That's, you know, patronage is not unusual. But what it does is disenfranchise the people who voted because they didn't vote for that person. They voted for their party. And now during this two-week period, which I consider to be anti-democratic, you can leave the party that voted you in and join the other party, leaving your party in a weaker position. This, fortunately, went away in 2009. They eliminated this provision. You can see the insidiousness of this. It's a real danger. For, there was a period when the Democratic Alliance, which was the main opposition party for the first time ever, woke up and realized that mostly white voters were paying attention to their party and that if they want to govern South Africa, they have to appeal to more than just white folks. So they made a concerted effort to get more black Africans to join their party. And again, they get to select who the ministers will be. So they picked uh, five or six black African ministers who joined their party, and then when they got their seats, based on the percentage of votes, they put them in the parliament. The first floor crossing exercise, every single black member of the Democratic Alliance left the Democratic Alliance and joined the African National Congress. Now that in itself is bad, but it gets worse because what did the African National Congress do? See, it's the party of the whites. They don't like black people. Look at this. You can see the perversions that take place with this going both directions. Fortunately, this disappeared. So it's no longer in South Africa's law. The parties select the MP or member of parliament, not the voters, I mentioned that, and the location. So one of the problems we had in the Western province a decade ago, that's the area around Cape Town, the ANC won governance of the province for the first time. In the first elections in 94, they didn't win. The opposition party won. Then they retook it later on. When they took control of that province, they used their term, we deployed our cadres. I'm sorry, I've been in the Army since the Cold War, and I remember fighting the Soviets, or at least preparing to fight the Soviets, so when I hear cadres, I get a little bit nervous. It makes me a little, but the ANC talks, that's their vernacular. We're deploying our cadres. They took people who were not from the same region, and at the time, the largest percentage of people who lived in the Cape Town area were white European descent or mixed race, or as they say in South Africa, colored, which is not a 1950s racist term in America that we're accustomed to, but actually it's a term that most South Africans who are in that mixed race group, they adhere to it, they take it on as their own, and they're proud to be called colored. So I just need to put that out there so you don't think I'm stuck in Selma in 1956 here. Um, so <laughs> mostly whites and mostly colors lived in Cape Town. What did the ANC do when they took over? They took people who were loyal to the party from other parts of the country and deployed their cadres and sent them to Cape Town. And then when people came to talk to the representative of parliament, they didn't listen to them. They weren't even the same. They were black Africans, not mixed race or whites, and they didn't, talk, they didn't want to talk to people there because their loyalty was not to you as the voter, but to the ANC. And it would be the same situation if the other party was in power. The president of South Africa is the head of state, and he also runs the government. So chief executive, similar to our system, but there are differences. Nobody voted for Nelson Mandela to be president, but he was president, right? Nobody voted for him, though. People did vote for him. People in his constituency, in a parliamentary-based system, he ran for as a member of parliament in his home district, and he was overwhelmingly, of course, elected. But he was not chosen by the people of South Africa. Of course, that was the sentiment. The people of South Africa obviously wanted him to be president, overwhelming majority of people, almost all. But the National Assembly votes, and the National Assembly selects the president, just like prime minister in Germany, or chancellor, or, uh, chancellor in Germany, or prime minister in the UK. It's the parliament that selects the president. Difference being, he's not a prime minister. And that's a very key distinction between South Africa, Europe, and the United States. Uh, in the United States, our president is not selected by Congress. God forbid. We'd have some challenges. So since he's in essentially a parliamentary system, very much like a British or German government, the government can collapse at any time. Someone can call for a vote of no confidence for the president, whereas in those other systems, it's a chancellor or the prime minister, right? So President Zuma, who's the current president of South Africa, has survived six no confidence votes. Now, how do you do that? Well, the African National Congress has an overwhelming majority in parliament. So unless their own party members vote against him, he will stay in office. The first five votes were open ballot. So we'd all be sitting here. This is the South African parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the speaker of the parliament. Uh, there's a motion on the floor to uh, no confidence for President Zuma. Please raise your hand if you have no confidence. How many ANC members do you think are going to raise their hand? 
Now I'm going to hand you a secret ballot, like a normal election. Cast your vote. In August, there was a vote of no confidence, the first secret ballot ever. President Jacob Zuma survived in office by 11 votes out of 400. At least 35 men. We don't know because it's secret. We didn't see who voted for what. But we can safely assume that most of the African National Congress did not vote to unseat him. But there are smaller opposition parties with seats, and some of them might have voted for him to stay. And that means if they did, that more of the ANC, but at least 35 members of the ANC secretly voted to depose this guy and send him packing. So there is some dissension within the party, and this is a big result of his leadership style and a series of corruption cases in South Africa, which has really given South Africa a black eye. So the judiciary is actually independent. The president can nominate judges, and there's a, a series of levels of courts similar, but not quite the same as our Supreme Court and our federal district court judges. It's similar. It's, I don't want to go into the depth, and I'd take a while to discuss it. I don't think you're here to hear about the judiciary. But the important point here is that the South African judiciary is independent. The president can nominate some of the judges, but he doesn't pick them. He doesn't decide. And it's not the parliament that decides. So Republicans can't hold up a vote. Democrats can't hold up a vote. That nonsense is gone. There is something known as the Judicial Service Commission, which is common in a lot of parliamentary countries, parliamentary systems. The Judicial Service Commission, Service Commission they are the ones, it's a body of 25 include, people, including members of parliament, but half are politicians and half are independent members of society with the right qualifications, doctors, lawyers, things like that. They meet, they discuss this, and they are the folks who choose and approve, approve who the judges are in South Africa. As a consequence, the courts have been very independent, and when the government has misbehaved, the courts have spanked them for it, which is a good sign. The reason I mention that is we're talking about a fragile democracy. There is a good sign that there are things in place that it's not quite as fragile as we might think it is, especially after I tell you about all the bad things happening, which is still coming. We're still going with that. All right, so 25 members. Sorry, I, I got ahead of my bullet there. All right, so this is what South Africa looked like on the eve of the first all-race or first majority election outcome, the first democratic election. Prior to this, only minority of people were able to vote. Mostly it was usually whites, uh, only men in the beginning. It became a country in 1910, only white men could vote, and then only white men with property, kind of like our system in the beginning. Uh, but then women were allowed to vote, uh, some uh, mixed race and some black Africans who owned property could vote, but they quickly lost their voting rights. So up until 1994, essentially only white South Africans could vote. And only those who were actually in the country at the time of the vote. You had to go home to vote. No absentee ballot. Now you can. This is what the country looked like. But you see all these little areas here, right? These green and blue and all these things. This is not working very well. There we go. So in the 1980s, the South African government came with this crazy idea that um, blacks don't really live in South Africa. They don't live here. They, yeah, they come and work in our mines, and you know, my maid is black, but they, black people don't live here. They live in their homelands or they were called the Bantu stands. And the South African government used its money to create these artificial states, which are quite odd if you look at them. KwaZulu, which was the homeland of the Zulu, according to the South African government, the racist government, this is where all the Zulu lived. But in reality, let me tell you something, the Zulu lived all of this and all the way up into here. So it was a way to exclude black Africans from owning land and put them into these tiny little parcels where they could effectively um, not govern themselves effectively. Yes, so um, that's the Bantu stance. But here's some things about the government. By 1990, South Africa was effectively a security state. It was a democracy for whites, but not really. It was really run by the security elites who ran the, the intelligence services, the military, and state organs like that, and the defense industry. They ran the country. Even though there were elections, those are the people who made all the decisions. They were concerned about the threat of communism. And until the fall of the Berlin Wall, the threat of communism gave the South African government a reason to exist. And a fair number of white voters in South Africa were much more afraid of communism and what was known as the Svat Gevar, or the black threat, the black African nationalist threat, that they were willing to allow this government to persist even though most people recognized it was morally wrong and it was a system that was not capable of lasting forever. Apartheid is what I'm talking about, the separateness of the races. But they used communism as a raison d'etre, the reason for being, to keep their government in power. But when the Soviet Union collapsed and the wall disappeared, the South African government looked around and said, ooh, 
we've run out of excuses. And this is one of the primary reasons why apartheid finally came to an end. A lot of people, and I, it, it may sound as if I don't like the African National Congress, I should tell you up front that I have a great deal of respect for the organization as a liberation era movement that tried to end races and bring freedom to all South Africans, no matter what their race is. But they have had difficulty transitioning from a liberation movement to a governing political party. So I do have a lot of respect for them, but also it, the reason I mention that is because it's going to sound like I really don't like the ANC based on the things I'm going to tell you. But I didn't do these things. The ANC did them. So <laughs> you be the judge of that. But the, Af the, the National Party that ruled apartheid South Africa was very much like the African National Congress is today with corruption. It was a patronage state in which a small white minority handed out jobs to favored friends and acquaintances and families. And it was a place in which the people who the system was set up for benefited from it, but they did it corruptly. Not everybody was corrupt, but my point is that the system was a system of patronage, and there was also corrupt contracts with defense manufacturers and things like that, because some of that's going to come up now. So in some respects, there are governance issues very akin now to what you saw during the apartheid era. It's just that most people have conveniently forgotten, especially white South Africans, that their government was corrupt and was full of patronage, and many of the things they're unhappy about today actually existed when there was a minority government. So you had, and you still have, I don't like the term third world, but it's, it's the best way to explain this is first and third world. You had, and you still have in South Africa, a first world economy, infrastructure, and right next to it's the third world. If you go to Cape Town, you land at the international airport, the first thing you're, you're, you're assaulted by when you go out the airport in a cab and go into Cape Town are informal housing, townships, where people have no plumbing. Now, some of that's changed, but it's still there. And then you drive into Cape Town, and you see mansions and gorgeous houses and clean, well-manicured lawns and electricity and all the modern conveniences you can think of. So you have a developed world and an underdeveloped world right next to each other. I mean, literally a stone's throw apart. Literally, you can actually throw a stone from a housing area to a mansion in South Africa in some places. The police during apartheid were very effective, but their job during apartheid was not to protect South Africans. Their job during apartheid was to protect white South Africans and expatriates who were living in South Africa and to oppress the majority. So they had very good secret police who were great at detaining people who showed any signs of objecting to that government. And they're also good at effectively sealing off white communities from the crime and violence. And so when the end of apartheid happened, a lot of white South Africans who were in some respects a bit oblivious, not many of them knew what was going on, but they were oblivious to the high levels of crime that were already existent in South Africa, suddenly found themselves in the midst of it. And so in 1994, if you were white and South African, you almost never saw violent crime. It happened, but rarely to you. Now, it doesn't matter who you are. A few years ago, Brett Kebble, a billionaire mining mag magnet, excuse me, magnet, a billionaire um, in the African National Congress, was assassinated in broad daylight at a stoplight in Santon City, the most expensive square mile of real estate on the entire continent of Africa. Glitzy malls, shopping areas, multi-million dollar mansions, stopped the traffic light, assassin came up, shot his driver in the face, and then shot him in the back seat. If you can assassinate somebody that well connected to the African National Congress in broad daylight, in the wealthiest part of the country, then security is an issue. I mentioned the Bantu stands. These homelands were created. They play a role later on, particularly in the formation of the new military, but I'm not going to talk about the military today. At least that's not my plan. So the South African apartheid government saw all the countries to the north of it as the frontline states, and those countries saw themselves in the same light. As black African nationalism expanded when the Portuguese left Mozambique and Angola in 1975, and then when Rhodesia became majority rule of black government in 1980 and became Zimbabwe, then Namibia became free in 1989. As this happened, the apartheid government saw black African nationalism coming right to their doorstep. And that formed a lot of their behavior at this time. And they called it the total onslaught. That was what they were concerned about. These encroaching black African states. Civil liberties were restricted under apartheid. Uh, some of you may remember uh, the bannings. If you remember in, in, in South Africa in the 1960s, the 70s, and 80s, people who spoke out were usually talking about white liberals who opposed the apartheid system or university students could be banned, which meant that no one could talk to them. They would be under house arrest effectively, could never leave their homes, couldn't speak freely, and could not have civil liberties. 
And this happened to a number of journalists and some politicians as well. But civil liberties for everybody were restricted. They used to have past laws in which if you were a black South African, you could only be in the cities during the daytime for work, for labor. You had to leave the cities at night, and you had to have a pass in order to go through police checkpoints. If you didn't, you could be arrested and detained. Uh, civil liberties were constrained. Today, South Africans, for the most part, have uh, the best civil liberties in the world. There are some restrictions on that, uh, some self-limiting because of racism that the government has put in place. South Africa, under apartheid, had the largest economy in Africa, and officially, until just a couple years ago, still had the largest economy, but Nigeria had failed to update their, their economic statistics for about 15 or 20 years, so now Nigeria's economy is officially twice as big as South Africa's. But throughout its history, it genuinely was the largest economy in all of Africa. At one point, 62% of all electricity generated in Africa was generated in one country, South Africa. Of course, that's a bigger statement on how underdeveloped Africa was than it was on how developed South Africa is. Because when that was the case, only 35% of South Africans had electricity. So that, that does a little something about that. The best infrastructure in Africa, it still has one of the most powerful economies on the continent, and it still has the best infrastructure on the continent. Uh, the thing is, is that under apartheid, there were daily contradictions. First and third world communities right next to each other. Liberty and complete restriction of civil liberty. So this is South Africa today. This is what it looked like in 1990 with six provinces. Cape Province, Orange Free State, Transvaal, Natal. I missed one. One, two, three, four. Sorry? Okay, yeah, so that was 1994. The, go the country was reorganized for administrative purposes, and this is what you have today. So you have in the North Limpopo province, there's also been a, a, an effort to even things out and change things. Unfortunately, under apartheid, there were some less than fortunate or proper names for some locations, uh, including using um, some profane, na profane names for some towns. A lot of that has changed, in part to reflect um, the heritage of groups who are near or come from these places. So what used to be the Transvaal province has been divided up into three provinces. Northwest province, Mpumalanga, Limpopo, and Hauteng. And Hauteng is, uh, means place of gold. That's where the gold comes from in South Africa. And they were the world's largest producer of gold until a few years ago. Now they're the fifth largest producer, and the gold mines are kind of dwindling down in South Africa. Uh, let's see. So you have KwaZulu and Tata, which is the homeland of the Zulu people, predominantly. And then you have, um, let's see, what else? Pumalang is listed up there too. That's the place of the, um, excuse me, the uh, Rising Sun. And then Limpopo is named after the Limpopo River, which is to the north. The Cape was divided into three provinces: the Northern Cape, the Western Cape, and the Eastern Cape. Now, this is language, and it's misleading. If you look at this, you'll see that. Right here, sorry. I know I keep bouncing back and forth between the slides. That's to make sure you're all awake. So, <laughs> make sure which screen you're watching. So, it's working, huh? So, the green stuff here, that's Afrikaans. That's what was originally 17th century Dutch, but rapidly changed over time. And while it's still closely related to Dutch, it became an African language in part by taking lots of loan words from African languages and borrowed words from, from people who came from Malaysia and Indonesia who contributed to the language. And it's become an African language. Uh, it's spoken uh, predominantly by white South Africans who came from that original group of people and the mixed race South Africans. But uh, a fair portion of South Africans can speak it as a second language because it was the language that was enforced during apartheid. Uh, but it's misleading on this chart because <laughs> this part of South Africa is virtually uninhabited. So you can have a majority of people here and just have a few thousand in some spots, whereas if you go in these belts here where the Zulu live, we're talking about millions, and here you're talking about a couple tens of millions in this zone, a heavy concentration here, and then the Cape. So this is where the, the home regions of languages spoken in South Africa, which has 11 official languages, 11 official languages. And there's been a movement afoot to create a 12th official language, South African Sign Language, but it has not gone very far. So 11 official languages. No government documents do not appear in 11 languages. <laughs> that would be a bit cumbersome. Uh, they used to appear in Afrikaans in English. Today they appear almost exclusively in English, even though only one in 10 people have English as their first language in South Africa, which most people are surprised to hear. You think South Africa, they speak English here. Well, they do. Almost everybody speaks English to some degree, but for first language, language you grow up in the house with your parents, grandparents, only one in 10 people. And most of them are white Europeans. 
But these are the other languages you'll see, Afrikaans, English, and Ndebele. In the end, Ndebele is a language also spoken in Zimbabwe. Uh, you have Kosa, where the X is there, Zulu, Pedi, Sutu, Tswana. Now, the Tswana people are here in this region where that kind of pink color is there. I guess that's pink. If you go across right here, if you know your geography, that's Botswana, which is the land of the Tswana speakers. They're the same ethnic groups. There are multiple sub-tribes, but the same ethnic group, and it's the same language. In South Africa, they usually call it Tswana. In Botswana, they usually call it Setswana, although in this chart, for some reason, they put Setswana. It's the same thing. And then you have Swati. Uh, if you look here in your geography, you'll know that little carve-out is where Swaziland is located at, and the Swazi live in Swaziland and outside in South Africa. And then you have the Venda, the Tsonga, and then you have a few spots where there's multiple languages and no one is in the plurality, or the majority. So that's just a little look at the language map. Khoedah is Afrikaans for good day. Dumela is good day, usually comes with sir or ma'am. Dumela ra, good day sir. Dumela ma, good day ma'am. And that is from Tswana and also from the Sutu language, which is closely related to it. And then we have Salbona. Has anyone flown to South Africa before? Anybody? Okay, a couple people. Uh, if you pull out behind the seat back, the little magazine is called Salbona. And that is Zulu for literally, I see you. But it's a greeting. Good day. So it's Salbona. All right, South Africa. Listen, statistics, uh, you know, all statistics are wrong. Uh, it's hard to get accurate statistics. It's probably about 53 million people in South Africa. Some sources are saying 56 million today, but the last census was in 2011, so we'll have to wait for the next one to get the actual number. So 53 million people. In 1911, there were 5 million people in South Africa. In 2016, 80% of South Africans were black Africans. But in 1911, that wasn't the case. Only two out of three were black Africans out of a population of 5 million. White Europeans at the time were over 20%, so one in five. Today, they're less than one in 10. Is that because there aren't more white Europeans? No, there's a lot more. There's just a little over a million in 1911. Today, there's just under 5 million. But there were 3 million black Africans, 4 million black Africans in 1911, and today there's 43 million, uh, plus 5 million immigrants from the rest of Africa who've gone in. So you hear about the wall that the president wants to build? South Africans have got an immigration issue, too, and there's a lot of xenophobia as a consequence of it. So also you have this population of Indian or Asian, and that's a... It's, a, the most, uh, it's mostly a result of the 19th century when the British were running South Africa. They brought Indians and Pakistanis over from the subcontinent to work in the sugar cane fields over here in KwaZulu Natal. And they brought them here as indentured servants or as free laborers, and they stayed. And they cut the sugar and worked in industry and things like that. Today, their descendants number well over a million people in South Africa. And that's that population, almost exclusively from the Indian subcontinent, typically called Indians although some of them are just other South Asians. Religions, uh, a mix of religions, predominantly Christian, though. You see Protestant here at 37%. Uh, then you have Catholic at 7%, and then other Christian denominations. So two-thirds of the people who follow religious faith in South Africa are Christian. Oh, well, if you throw the Catholics in, it's even higher. So Muslims make up a small portion. But the Muslim community in South Africa is the oldest. Well, it's in Cape Town, excuse me. Over here in Cape Town... There's a Muslim community here. It's the oldest Muslim community in South Africa. They have been there since the 1680s. The Dutch, when they arrived in 1652, tried to get the local Africans, who were the Bushmen, the San, and the Khoi, who were herders, generally speaking. They tried to get those folks to work for them. And uh, they couldn't convince many of them. And when they couldn't convince them, they tried to enslave them. It didn't work out too well. Those folks didn't, didn't, didn't want to be slaves, and they just sit there, sat there and did nothing. So the Dutch turned to the East Indies, which is why they had a station there in the first place for the ships going from Europe to the Indies to get spices and things like that. And they brought slaves from Malaysia and Indonesia, Indonesia primarily. And those folks came, and they were Muslim for the most part. And that was the first Muslim community in South Africa, in Cape Town in the 1680s down here. That community still exists today. They're known as the Cape Malays. They're mostly considered part of the ethnic group, the Coloreds, and they've been around for centuries. And they've mixed in with other folks, with white Europeans, and with Africans as well. Then you also have a component of Muslims who came with the Indians and Pakistanis from the Indian subcontinent in the 19th century. And so you have a significant portion of Muslims that live in the Durban area here, which is an epicenter of Indian settlement, and then also some up here in the capital area in Hauteng. So you saw the video. 
I don't know if you could hear very well, but did you hear there was about 100,000 people at the opening ceremony? You hear people singing the national anthem? I go to Hershey Bears games, and it's me and six other people and 9,000 singing the anthem. It's kind of embarrassing. And we consider ourselves to be patriotic. Of course, if you go to Pittsburgh, man, those people love the anthem. I'll tell you what, I went to, I went to the dreaded Penguins. I hate the Penguins, by the way, sorry. I went to a peg, sorry, I guess you're going to leave now, right? No, I, I hate the Penguins, uh, but, but I do like Columbus Blue Jackets. I went for the Stanley Cup playoffs, and I stood up, and, you know, it used to be we were prohibited out of uniform from saluting, but they, they changed the regulation, and now as soldiers, we're allowed to salute out of uniform. So I proudly salute every time the anthem is played, and I sing it because I know the words because I'm from Baltimore, and if I didn't learn it, I couldn't go home at night. So <laughs> you're laughing. It's true. Public school, it's not just those Catholics that do that stuff. Anyway, so, uh, so I'm proud of the anthem, and I sing it. But when I went to Pittsburgh, and I, I just stood up, and I put my hand up to salute, and it was like 18,000 people singing the anthem. I almost fell over. But I love the Bears, but when I go there, it's me and six other people. I think we're going to start a club. Anyway, but if you think Americans are patriotic, oh, good Lord, South Africans are patriotic. It doesn't matter their ethnic origin. And it's not just you know, like a lot of the world, soccer. You know, oh, yeah, okay, I'm from wherever. Yeah, yeah, I'm French because of soccer. No, these people love their country. They may not love their government, they may not love their history, but they love their country. I have been a few places in the world where I consider to be uber patriotic. I would say the United States is one of those. I think most of us can agree we're kind of uber patriotic. And, and I, I mean that in a good sense. Sweden. You can't go around Sweden and go past a farmhouse or a property without seeing a Swedish flag flying. It's, it's, it's amazing. Those people are very patriotic, and I'm still trying to figure out why. Their flag is kind of cool, so I'm not sure why. Anyway, uh, Botswana. People in Botswana are very patriotic. If you live in Botswana, it doesn't matter if you're white, you're black African, or you're Bushman, and if somebody asks you in Setswana, what are you? Hey, que Motswana? I'm a Motswana. I'm a, I'm a Botswana. They forged a national identity in just 50 years in South Africa. Ooh, they're very patriotic. But these people are worse than us about complaining. Sit down for a beer or a braai, which is a barbecue with South Africans of any group, and in, in invariably, within minutes, they'll be complaining about the country and their government. So we have a lot in common. I'm serious. Okay, so I, I, I'm hesitant to put these slides up, but I think they're important so you get an appreciation for where people live. Now, obviously, this isn't the only place where people live. You can go any place in South Africa and find virtually any ethnic group. But the predominance of the population, the darker the green, the heavier the concentration. So I, I don't really like to label black. What, what is black, anyway? Is somebody, if they're brown, are they black? And what is white? Are Italians white, or, or Swedes white, or Arabs white, or, or Kazakhs white? We all get the sense of what that is, but I'm not sure I like that label. But these are clear ethnic distinctions in South Africa. So black South Africans, you can see, live in this area predominantly. Not many in the Western Cape, just a handful, right? That's the stronghold of the opposition party, which was originally perceived as the Whites Party, the post-independence, post-94 White Party, if such a thing exists. And that's their stronghold down here in Cape Town, the Western Province. You look for white South Africans, it's lighter, but there are about... Eight, seven or eight million white South Africans. They're down here in the Western Cape, but also up here, where all the money's at. 40% of South Africa's gross domestic product is located right there in Hauteng Province, between Johannesburg and Pretoria. 40% of the entire country's output in that small zone. And about 12 million people live there, 14 million people. And most of the whites live there. And there's some that live up here in the north. Colors. Now look at that. I said the whites live in the, down here, right? But look where the colors in South Africa live, the mixed race. In that sparsely populated area, this part of South Africa is known as the Karoo. It's semi-desert, and it's pretty dry. Uh, and this rest of this is pretty dry, too. And then the Western Cape. So coloreds and uh, Afrikaans-speaking South Africans have a lot in common. They come from the same sort of people. Most of them are Dutch Calvinists. They speak the same language. And they tend to live in the same areas for the most part. And then I talked about Indians or Asians. Can you see where the green is here? Right there around Durban? This is where the majority, okay? So as only 2% of the population, it's going to be hard to do the majority in physical space. And then also up in parts of Hauteng. There are big Indian communities up there, part of the business community. All right, so some select factors here. Am I doing okay? Can I keep going? Okay. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's, we should ask the audience, not the guy in charge, right? <laughs> I was asking the guy in charge. Sorry, I'm in the Army, so. 
Anyway, uh, so social indicator. Let me, let me point out a few things here. You can look at this chart. It's not critical. Uh, South Africa has some development issues. I mentioned a first in, in developing world economy side by side. A population about 56 million roughly. Uh, life expectancy 62, but I find other sources to say it's 57. It's not as good as other parts of the world. Uh, in part, that's because of HIV, and I'm getting to that. Uh, fertility rates, by the way, the, I'm sorry, the, the brackets are from 1990, okay? I, this is current, or as current as I can get, mostly from 2016, but the brackets, you compare it to 1990. So in 1990, the lifespan was 62, it hasn't gone up. And that's because so many people have been affected by HIV and died from it. They've had uh, a few million people die from HIV in the last 20 years. Uh, and then the fertility rate was 3.7%, it's 2.5. That's a good thing. That means population is going to stabilize. It's not going to keep growing out of control. School enrollment was only 66%, secondary school, right? I should say secondary, yeah, secondary school. So only 66% of South Africans went to high school in 1990. Today it's 99%. Big improvement, right? All right, so good news, right? There's some good news, okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to find some somewhere here. Uh, this is the scary part here. Less than 1% of South Africans were HIV positive in 1990. Today, it's 19%. That's across all ethnic groups. In some ethnic groups, it's hit more hardly than others. More, it's hit harder than others. Um, that's a little bit scary. Now, this statistic I'm skeptical of because I found multiple statistics, but it said that in 1990, 82% of South Africans had access to clean piped water. Uh, I found statistics say it's more like 30% of the population had access. Most people that didn't live in white areas didn't have municipal water, didn't have uh, sewage, didn't have plumbing. Uh, but whatever the case is today, 93%, it should be 100%, right? Unless you're like me from Appalachia, then you fetch water from a cistern, but uh, true story, by the way. But uh, it should be 100%, but it's 93%, but that's tremendous improvement, yes? So why does that matter? Well, if people have to waste time walking and fetching water from a well, you know, you lose a lot of time coming back. Not to mention, if you don't have clean water, what do you get? Diseases, right? And that affects things. So here's some more. Improved sanitation. 51% had sanitation, sewage, plumbing, that sort of thing. 66% today. Now, this, is, this looks good, but it's not good. $115 billion was the size of their GDP in 1990, before apartheid ended. Today, now this figure, you see multiple, that's the closest to reality, is about $300 billion. So what, almost three times as large, right? Factor in inflation, which was running at 5 to 7% per year, and that becomes a lot less impressive than it actually is. That's not the good thing, and we'll talk about that coming up. Uh, in 1990, foreign direct investment was negative. People were taking money out of South Africa because of apartheid, disinvesting, and today it's uh, two and a quarter billion dollars last, last year. And then official development assistance, um, <laughs> that money was being pulled out too, <laughs> and today there's about $1.4 billion a year in formal assistance from foreign partners. Uh, this chart here shows you the gross domestic product growth rate in South Africa. South Africa, based on its situation and wealth disparity and the level of income for people, would consistently need at least 5% GDP growth year on year for at least a decade before they make significant progress in improving the lives of the entire population. Does that chart approach 5% anywhere? Now, that's 4% right there. And oh, by the way, it's mostly trending down. Since 2008, South Africa's economy has actually contracted in real terms after inflation adjusted dollars. Its economy is smaller today than it was a decade ago but the population is about 8 million larger than it was a decade ago. That's a problem. So, where do people live? Well, <laughs> all sorts of places. If you think back to the apartheid era, you think of the townships, and of course you probably heard of Soweto, yes? Which is actually an acronym, it stands for Southwest Townships. That's where it came from. It's not an African word, it's, it's, it's just an acronym that the government officials made up. Soweto, Southwest Townships, because it's on the southwest corner of Johannesburg. So this is Alexandria, which is in Johannesburg. That settlement right there, which is informal, mostly without plumbing, electricity, is about two kilometers from the wealthiest part of all of Africa, even today. Last time I was in, Pretor or in Johannesburg, I stayed in a nice little rental place, a bed and breakfast, where I rented a house there for part of a big compound. And uh, we didn't have water for three days because somebody cut the water pipeline over here in Alexandria. And I thought about it, I said, boy, can you imagine if the architects of apartheid and separation of races had realized that the water for the ritzy part of South Africa was coming through a township? They'd probably be rolling over in their graves. But that's where we got our water from. And these are some other places. You can see very expensive homes in Pretoria. Uh, this is in Soweto. Uh, Soweto has a reputation of being slums. 
but much of it has been developed and is quite nice. There are still slums there. Uh, and then these are government-built uh, social housing, these two here in different parts of the country. So some of the key issues. All right, it's a young democracy, and we've got to be fair with South Africa. They have been doing this for a long time. Uh, the system of government before this was not set up to benefit all South Africans. So they've only had a government that's addressing the needs of all South Africans since 1994. We've been around a little bit longer, and the concept of democracy has been around a lot longer. I mean, the Greeks, last time I checked, they're the ones that started it. So we've been messing around and playing with and experimenting with democracy for a long time. And in the Anglo-Saxon world, since at least 1215 with the Magna Carta, we've been playing around with individual liberties and rights and things like that. So this young democracy took the place of a patronage-based security state, which I've talked about before. Land. This is a very sensitive issue in South Africa, and it comes up all the time. Uh, it's interesting. There was a, I would say, very pragmatic decision made on land in South Africa at the conference which, was, which brought all the opposition movements and the government together, the apartheid government, plus the Bantu stands, those little homelands. Their governments all came together for something known as CODESA. That was the Congress for a Democratic South Africa in the early 1990s. This big conference then negotiated out what the system of government would be, how the elections would be run, and then they put the conditions in place to create a new constitution during the first term of that government. The decision was made that there would be no valid land claims in South Africa that predate 1910. Anybody have any idea why 1910 would matter? Why would you pick 1910? Yes, sir? There were thousands of years that the Union South Africa was Absolutely correct. So if, if you're a historian and you look at this dispassionately, I didn't say fairly, I said dispassionately, okay? If you look at this dispassionately, you go, you know what? South Africa was a collection of colonies, independent kingdoms, and, and independent nations it, before 1910. The Union of, of South Africa Act created it in 1910. It became a country for the first time ever. Part of the United Kingdom's greater empire, but it was a country in 1910. So anything before that would be considered to be conquest or the result of settlement. Is that fair? No, but uh, I'm sorry, folks, but that's the history of humankind. Uh, we go back to uh, our very beginnings, and unfortunately, that's how life works. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's reality. So I say they made a very pragmatic decision that no land claims would be considered before 1910. But people have forgotten that now, as land is still a sensitive issue. Uh, the government said that they would take approach, which Zimbabwe initially took, which was a willing buyer, willing seller basis. So the Ministry of Lands would look at all farm sales, all property sales, and they would have a say and approve the sales, and the government could purchase land to redistribute to people. But there was another provision put in place, and this provision was that anyone who had their land taken from them, or their parents, or their grandparents, or any relative, or anyone from their ethnic group that's related to them. You can't just say, hey, look, I'm Lithuanian, so any Lithuanian got robbed, I get their land. No, you have to be related to them. Back to 1910. Back to 1910, when they first started imposing racist legislation to, to disenfranchise and take land away from Africans in 1913 with the Native Lands Act, which was amended in 1936. It's a long history. And it continued up until the 80s. In the 1980s, over 3.5 million black South Africans were dispossessed of their property, their land, and relocated to these homelands. 3.5 million out of a population at the end of apartheid that was only 36 million. So 1 in 10 were dislocated just in the 1980s. So this went on for a long time. But anyone could file a land claim. So if your grandparents had their land taken, you could file on their behalf, even though they've long since passed from the earth. There were 77,000 land claims filed in South Africa, and seldom talked about, but over 75,000 have been resolved to date. You wouldn't know that from reading the news. You'd think that no one settled land in South Africa. The problem is that most of the contentious issues have not been resolved. People who were taken from a city area like Cape Town, which had an area known as District 6, and they were moved to, move, to, to allow for another settlement to take place, uh, they're not going to get that land back as a practical matter. The government offered them cash. People took the cash, so one claim settled, another claim settled, another claim. A lot of the remaining land claims are to rural areas, farms, where people lost their farmland, and they're contentious. But it is a very explosive issue on all sides, but particularly among white Afrikaans speakers who feel under assault and among many black Africans who feel there's been no fairness and restitution. This is an issue that South Africa must address and is failing abysmally at. The African National Congress has not taken the issue seriously. In fact, they have purchased 4,000 farms from willing sellers. At the end of apartheid, there were 68,000 commercial white farmers in South Africa. Today, there are about 36,000. Many have left the business or others bought, bigger, bought land, made bigger farms. 
The government has purchased 4,000 farms in South Africa, which they have yet to distribute to anyone else. So it's an issue that needs to be addressed. But honestly, and, and the argument is very emotional on all sides. So people have a hard time divorcing emotion from facts. And it makes it even more challenging. Wealth disparity. South Africa is one of the countries with the worst wealth disparity in the world. If you're familiar with the Gini coefficient, which shows wealth uh, disparity, a number of something like 25, just for a baseline, is good. Um, if you're looking at it for evenly sp uh, distributed, distributed wealth, excuse me. South Africa is 64. Uh, higher number is bad. Uh, the United States is, um, we're like 41st in the world. So it's not great, but it's not as horrible as people make it out to be. Uh, there was an effort to address this at the end of apartheid with the Mandela government. They had something called GEAR, Growth Education Redistribution. It did not work very well. It was a noble idea, but it didn't really distribute wealth very well. Then they came out with BE, Black Economic Empowerment. For the ANC, black is anybody that's not white. For South Africans, that's not black. Blacks in South Africa are black, to them, to others. Coloreds are colored, South Africa for the most part, although some consider themselves to be black. And whites are whites. Uh, so the, South Af the, the ANC said anything, anyone who's not white is black. This was a program set up to direct contracts for government services and procurement to black economic enterprises and to help found them. And there were a lot of mechanisms that took place here, but one of the things that did happen is that the government pressured multinationals and large South African corporations to divest parts of their shares of their company. So you give away 25% of your stock to a group which is recognized as a black economic empowerment group. Unfortunately, this did not make South Africans wealthier. Want to take a guess what it did? It made a small number of black South Africans very wealthy. So now instead of a small number of very wealthy whites who have all the money, you have a small number of very wealthy whites and a fair number of very wealthy blacks who are connected to the government, and one of them is Cyril Ramaphosa, and we'll talk about him shortly. There's another term floating out there now, which is part of this whole discussion. It's called white monopoly capital. And that's a discussion about, about all the wealth being concentrated in the hands of white South Africans. And that's a fair argument. Uh, wealth is concentrated per capita, overwhelming in the hands of white South Africans. But if you look at stock market capitalization in South Africa, white South Africans own about 23% of the stock as a group. And black South Africans, including all the other groups, own about 21%. I'm not good at math, but that's not 100%, right? <laughs> Who owns the rest? Everybody got a pension? Got a 401k plan? You probably do. The rest of the world, foreign investors own big chunks of South Africa's equity outside the country. And yeah, there are a lot of you probably white, but anyway, so but the label white monopoly capital is out there. It's not, it's not fictitious, but, but it is a term thrown about to complain about the disparity. We might want to take a break shortly, yes? Or keep going? Okay, okay. All right, so expropriation redistribution. So what is the solution to this wealth disparity and the lingering effects of racism in South Africa, which still exists, trust me. I've been to South Africa about 450 times, maybe 500 times. I lived next door in Botswana, so I was 20 minutes from the border, so you imagine where I went every weekend, because uh, I love Botswana, but trust me, Habaroni is a very boring place to be. Uh, I hope there's no Botswana in the room. Anyway, uh, yeah, so expropriation redistribution. The African National Congress is not addressing this from the perspective of many poor black South Africans. We voted you in. It's been 23 years. You were supposed to fix things. How come I'm still poor? How come I, my kids go to school and they have to walk there and there's no school books? Fair questions, yes? yes? To be fair to the ANC, they inherited a mess. It takes time to fix it, but it's been affected greatly by corruption, which has affected this. So a lot of folks are upset about this. So inside the party itself, it's fracturing. There are factions inside the party, and we just saw this play out in December in the leadership crisis about who was going to succeed Zuma as president of the party. You saw two different camps, one that was for expropriation, taking property away, taking all the big mining companies and giving them to black Africans. I'm not really sure how that works in principle unless you give everybody a share of the company, but, but the point is to take it away from um, white monopoly capital and redistributing land and redistributing property. Uh, Zimbabwe tried this. Uh, I don't know if you followed events in Zimbabwe the last 20 years. It hasn't gone very well. Um, and it didn't go very well for some other countries in Africa that have tried it. And it didn't go very well for Uganda when they kicked out the Asians in the 1980s, 1970, excuse me. But there is a genuine sense of frustration and expectations. If you all remember, and I'm sure all of us are old, old, old enough in this room to remember, trust me, 1994 and the all-race elections, the world was entranced with South Africa. The rainbow nation, Mandela, becomes president. 
So much goodwill for South Africa. So much pent up desire for South Africans to succeed. Imagine if you were South African. <laughs> you finally get to vote. People stood in line for nine hours to vote for the first time in their lives. 89-year-old women who never had the right to vote standing in the hot sun for nine hours to vote, and they got to cast their vote because it was symbolic, but they wanted change. But most South Africans, many South Africans, they've seen very little change, and so they're frustrated. Who do they blame? They blame the ANC, right? Some still blame apartheid, and some of that's appropriate, but not all of it. Race, very complicated issue. Woo! <laughs> we could talk about this for days, uh, but it, the important thing I want to talk about here is it's a political tool used by whites, blacks, coloreds, Asians for political gain, just like anywhere else, right? You know, in New York, you know, these damn Irish coming in here. No Irish in the bar. Get out, you know? That's not race, but that's ethnicity. But you get my point. It's a very complicated issue. I can tell you that if you went to Botswana and you're a white woman and you're with a black man, nobody notices. Nobody cares in Botswana. Honestly, I swear to God. Go there. Check it out. Date a black guy. Date a white guy. Go check it out. It's not an issue. It's not something people focus on. But you can drive an hour away and go to Zeros to cross the border in South Africa and be a white woman with a black man still today. Ooh, people are going to notice that. Or be a white man with a black woman. Of course, that's probably less of a thing that people pay attention to because they probably figure a sugar daddy the relationship there. But, but, um, but it is a very sensitive issue, and people still talk about it. And there are real concerns there. There are some South Africans of all races who are stuck in apartheid, who are stuck in the idea that one race is better than another, and they can't get themselves out of that. Either they don't want to or they're not capable of it. And this affects relations in South Africa. Uh, there have been very significant issues the last couple of years where, where white South Africans have made a very rude or, or racist comment and uh, they lose their job or they're hounded out of town. And now it's happening to black South Africans too for saying the same sort of thing. They actually have things in place to talk to prevent people from abusing people. Human dignity is guaranteed in the Constitution. So if you assault someone's human dignity, you can be brought up on charges. And of course, using racist terms could assault someone's human dignity. So it's a very complicated thing. But, but bear in mind that all parties use, not all people, and not all political parties, but all groups in one way or another use race as a political tool, even to this day. Corruption. Oh, good Lord. We could talk about this for about three weeks. And this is one of the reasons why I personally am frustrated with the African National Congress. Great respect for them as a liberation era movement to help end apartheid. They weren't the only actor, but they were an important actor during the end to ending apartheid. But corruption is beyond conception. It has gotten so bad that many young South Africans see the path to prosperity and wealth accumulation as gaining political office. Why? Do we pay public servants a lot? No. But when you're in public office, you control where the contracts go. When you control where the contracts go, you get your cut if you're corrupt. Now, not everybody's corrupt. It's not the majority of the population in the party, but it is quite common. The arms deal, right after the ANC comes in power in the late 1990s, they negotiate an arms deal purchasing submarines from the Germans, jet fighters from Sweden, cruisers, naval cruisers from the Germans, and a whole bunch of other military equipment on the order of about $6 billion of military hardware. South Africa has no neighbors that are threatening its borders. Uh, it uses forces almost exclusively for peacekeeping, going abroad. Last time I checked, submarines don't work very well in the Congo. Um, <laughs> not that I'm criticizing the arms deal. I mean, I am in the army, you know, arms, it's okay. No, but uh, the, the upshot of this is that instead of focusing on development, they had this big arms deal. And people are like, why are they buying all these arms? Until a few years later when we discovered that, ooh, a lot of well-connected senior members of the ANC were getting money in their pockets for directing contracts to Thompson and Talis, the French firms, and for directing contracts to other companies. And it was a big scandal. And guess who was also part of the arms scandal? Who's been indicted and has charges against him for being complicit in this? President Jacob Zuma. This is arms deals nearly 20 years ago, and it has not left the scene. It is still a political issue today. In Kanla, that is President Zuma's personal residence and his play, birthplace in KwaZulu-Natal. It is a uber mansion, which has had several million dollars spent on it for his personal residence. Not the executive residence for the president of, of South Africa. His personal residence. All of his neighbors lack electricity that surround his house. Most of them have no plumbing. They live in abject poverty. And they're Zulu. And he used state money to build this. And they used flimsy excuses about how it was necessary to protect the president when he goes back there like Camp David, you know, like going to Camp David on the weekend. Um, a lot of people in South Africa of all races are very upset about this abuse of state funds. Um, we're not talking about tens of millions of dollars, but nonetheless, 
it's impropriety. It's taking place. Soccer World Cup. I saw you in the video. Very exciting. South Africa, the first African country to host the World Cup. Exciting. Wonderful. Yes? Also corrupt. The people that put the World Cup together, bribe, set, bladder, and all those other turds. Sorry. Up at the, uh, up at the FIFA. So you've seen the indictments against Seth Blatter, the Swiss national, and many, many members of the International Soccer Association, or FIFA, right? Bribes were paid so that South Africa would win the bid and have it. Now, I was there. It was wonderful. I enjoyed the World Cup. I don't really like soccer, but I enjoyed the World Cup. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we find out after the fact that it was corrupt, and bribes took place. Oilgate. South Africa sold its entire strategic petroleum reserve of 10 million barrels at less than market prices, less than 50% of market prices. A tender was put out. It was not announced in the press. Big oil companies like Chevron and Mobil, who uh, do business in the area and would have bid on it, didn't even know about it. It was awarded to a couple little companies, a couple of which are these black economic enterprises, and some are foreign firms, and all their oil is gone. Now, the oil is still in South Africa. It just doesn't belong to the government of South Africa anymore. So that'd be like uh, if President Trump sold our strategic petroleum reserve to somebody from India. Here you go. For $10 million, and it's worth $30 billion. The entire oil reserve. This is a big scandal in South Africa because there's something corrupt going on. Oh, sorry. The whole issue of these black economic enterprises, many of which are honest, good businesses, people trying, but an awful lot of them are involved in contracts in which they don't deliver. One example is that in Eastern Cape, school children have been going to primary schools in many districts without textbooks for the last decade because a company was awarded a contract and it was just a shell company. They took all the money and delivered zero textbooks and the ANC covered it up. But the journalists uncovered it and people are angry about it. State capture, which is a term that was originally associated with the World Bank with the Central Asian states, about, it's the concept of, of abusing the state to take advantage of things so you can pilfer society. An example of this would be the Gupta family, which is an Indian family that lives in South Africa and is related to all kinds of corrupt practices. They're being charged on a number of things. Um, tried to maneuver because of the relationship with President Zuma to have one of their hand-picked people within the ANC become minister for a particular portfolio. Why? So that they can direct all the contracts in the direction. And this concept of state capture is all over the news today. Language, ethnicity. I talk about 11 official languages. You saw in Kose Silikilele, Africa, which is the national anthem. Uh, there are efforts at reconciliation, and the anthem is one of those things. You saw people singing with pride. They take pride in that. Naming conventions, the naming of places. We saw how some of the province names were changed. The naming of cities continues to this day in municipalities. It is a point of contention. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes everyone agrees. For instance, when they renamed what used to be known as PVW, um, which is an abbreviation for the area, um, known as Hautang, there were virtually no objections to calling Hautang because the word means place of gold. And so everybody's pretty happy with that. But some names are very contentious. Service delivery. The African National Congress campaigned that they would deliver one million houses to South Africans in five years, and they would provide electricity and pipe water to South Africans. Um, they didn't meet that target, but to be fair to them, they eventually got that million homes, and they built a lot more since then. The government has provided housing to millions of South Africans, and today, about 22 million South Africans live entirely on welfare, public handouts. They get a subsistence check from the government. Without it, they would probably starve to death or have to resort to theft or something like that. 22 million South Africans out of 53 million or 55 million. That's a lot. Sorry? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so service delivery is a contentious issue, and it still continues to this day. The opposition, the main opposition party, the... Democratic Alliance, one of their big arguments is that we can do service delivery. We can do, well, guess what? In elections in 2016, they took control of half of South Africa's main cities, and now they're finding out it's not as easy as they thought it was. So they're struggling to deliver just like the ANC did. Crime and public safety. Crime is off the charts. Crime got so bad a decade ago that the South African government refused to publish crime statistics. Rape is unheard of. The number of people that are raped, men and women, it's astounding. A couple years ago when I was traveling through South Africa, these thugs were throwing cinder blocks on the secondary, it's like a highway, but it's, a, it's not the interstate, a secondary road, to stop cars with the full intent of robbing the passengers and raping and murdering them. And they robbed and raped and murdered men and women. They didn't care who you are, black, white, male, female. It's out of control. Uh, about a decade ago, the main train which runs up between the capital, 
these gangs were jumping on the train and for no reason at all, riding between the trains, grabbing people and throwing them off a high-speed train to their deaths. Something like 75 people died from being thrown off the train. Never did find out what that was all about. Uh, I'm not trying to scare you away from South Africa. I'm just trying to tell you that safety is a real issue. And the police have been led by politicians and corrupt bureaucrats, not police officials, ever since the end of apartheid. And that's a problem. Public institutions. This is the good news. South Africa has a lot of public institutions within the government and in civil society that are very effective and in many respects largely independent. And in many ways, they are what has helped keep the glue to keep this whole thing from falling apart while the ANC is trying to figure out whether they're going to govern honestly or they're going to allow these criminals in their midst, and there are plenty of them, to continue. The media. South Africa has a vibrant media. Oh, they do a lot of investigative journalism. There's a very popular show that's been on for over 20 years now, about 30 years, called Carte Blanche. And Carte Blanche is an investigative reporting series, something like 60 Minutes used to pretend to be back in the day, you know, 40 years ago. They actually go out and do investigative reports, and they catch people. I remember watching a program 20 years ago in which they went out, and many South Africans use public transportation. But it's not owned by the state, it's private vendors. So they'll get in these little, like, you know, Toyota minivans that seat eight people, that 37 people sit in. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good luck with that, folks. Anyway, so um, they went out and they followed these guys around. It was time to get their inspection sticker for public safety, you know, make sure it's a safe vehicle. Bless you. So they went and they, in order to get the sticker, you've got to be inspected by the police. So they found two policemen, a black policeman and a white policeman, both corrupt, dirtbags, and the guy paid a bribe. There you go. Here's your sticker. Puts it in a windshield. Well, Car Blanche took the, truck, or the, the, the van and tested the braking system, just the braking system. Four brakes, right? You got the two in the front and the two in the rear. One brake worked. The driver's side, and it was operating at 16% of capacity. Well, again, I'm not good at math, but four brakes, that's 400%. 16%, that's not good. <laughs> anyway, so uh, corruption is all over. But the press exposes these things. The reason we know about Oilgate, the reason we know about, about uh, the Unconley issue, the reason we know about all these other things, the World Cup, is because the press has exposed this. And this keeps South Africans engaged and gives many people hope that they can change the course of events. The ANC has got some, yeah. All right, I'm going to have to wrap up. i got a lot more slides here, but we're not going to get a chance for questions. So, so I, what I'll do is when I, we take a break here is I'll use the rest of the slides to answer your questions because it'll talk about political parties and things like that. Um, the, the hazard with talking about South Africa is I could talk forever. The greater hazard is when you ask Colonel Wyatt to come talk, I really can't talk forever. So um, we'll talk about these other issues after we take a break. I thank you for your patience. You all have been very patient. Uh, and uh, so we take a break. You mentioned 99% uh, uh, school enrollment. Uh, does that equal functional literacy? Uh, what's, the, what's the impact? Still on? Can you hear me in the back? OK, I think here. Yes, sir, that's actually a very good question, and one which, if I had lots of time, I'd have spent time. So I'm glad you asked it. Here's the thing. Um, much like a lot of places around the world, um, education standards are not where they should be. Uh, now, this is a broad generalization, so you can hold me to it, but uh, you may find detractors that, that won't agree with my answer. Under apartheid, most white South Africans had world-class education. I mean, you know, it was incredibly inexpensive. If you want to send your kids, if you're from the UK, to Eton, very exclusive, private school, that level of education, I don't know what we have here in the U.S. for those private schools. I went to public school, so I don't know. But, but that sort of thing where you send your kids off to a really ritzy school and they have manicured lawns, people are playing cricket, and they're learning about calculus in sixth grade. I mean, I, I don't think I ever learned about calculus. <laughs> but they get fantastic educations. Most whites got that. Even those who went to public schools got that because that's where the resources were put. Very few black African kids got anything beyond rudimentary skills to become literate at best. They weren't exactly being taught to be critical thinkers in most schools. There were exceptions, but that's the story for the most part. Unfortunately, and this is a broad generalization, after the end of apartheid, instead of reinforcing the good schools, what public money went to school, now there's a lot of private schools which are still at that standard in South Africa, private schools. But the public schools that were at that same level, much of that money has been redistributed and spread around. So they've, instead of making a bigger pie, although they're spending more on education, but they're not keeping up with population growth or needs. They spread the wealth around, and they spread the talent around. And another insidious thing happened, unfortunately, too. An awful lot of public teachers were Afrikaners, because remember, I talked about a patronage system in which the government favored its favorite group, which were the Afrikaans. Not even the English-speaking South Africans, whites, but the Afrikaans-speaking. So a lot of Afrikaans South Africans were public school teachers. Well, they were encouraged, or they were forced out of education. 
and they were replaced by people, for the most part, who weren't qualified to teach because there was an urgency to rebalance the scales so that it was fair. I appreciate the sentiment, but you can't educate kids with people who aren't prepared. And so that created a problem. So the situation in South Africa is abysmal today. They have what they call the matric. You know, that's when you finish, you take a big exam like in the UK. You do your A levels or O levels, whichever it is. You take the big exam, whether you graduate school and where you place to go to university. The uh, passing rate for the matrix in South Africa a couple years ago was 13%. 13% of South Africans were educated well enough to pass the basic minimum level to graduate high school. So instead of fixing the education system, they went back and lowered the standards to 58% for grades. And suddenly, 75% of South Africans matrix. This is the state of education in South Africa. It's unfair to whites, it's unfair to blacks, it's unfair to every South African child. And it gets even worse if you go to places like KwaZulu-Natal, where sadly, it is not uncommon for young schoolgirls, and we're talking about pre pubescent schoolgirls too, and those who've, who've reached that stage, to get their grades by sleeping with their male teachers. Now that's even worse than it sounds. We're talking about sexual abuse, we're also talking about 75% of the male teachers in KwaZulu-Natal are HIV positive. So pregnancy, damage to young bodies, and possibly HIV. Now, that's not everywhere, but it is a serious problem in education. So yes, it, no, it's not at the level it needs to be. That said, Elon Musk is from South Africa, right? You know who he is, right? SpaceX, PayPal, guy's a multi-billionaire, got some great ideas, except this big crazy battery factory in California. It's not working out so well. But anyway, yes, yeah, so the education system. Yeah, Trevor Noah is also from South Africa, Sorry? correct? Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah, America. that's right. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I used to think it was funny when he was in South Africa. <laughs> yeah. uh, my question is related to the nuclear program that uh, South Africa had in the 80s and 90s. Yes. Um, uh, how secure is that pile and, and the work that they have uh, developed over the years to have a nuclear pro uh, weapon? Okay. Uh, South Africa actually detonated a nuclear bomb in the uh, South Atlantic in the 1970s, although they've never admitted to it, but they did. But no, that's not classified. I, I got it from WikiLeaks. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to read that sometime. Anyway, no, but uh, they did. They, they detonated a nuclear bomb. They developed a nuclear bomb. They had a nuclear program. Um, uh, there is a total confidence by the, the rest of the world and the International Atomic Ener Energy Agency that South Africa has completely disbanded the nuclear weapons program and they have nothing, not even precursor material. That said, they do have nuclear capacity. They have a nuclear power plant outside of Cape Town in Kuburg, which has two reactors. They're pebble bed reactors and it's a unique design which they've attempted to sell. Unfortunately, one of the customers they want to sell it to is Iran. Um, so that's a problem for the United States and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, they uh, are now, unfortunately, another corruption deal, and I'll end this, i answer your question, but just one more piece about atomic stuff. Another thing going on now is that Jacob Zuma, in 2014, traveled to Russia, where he met, uh, by the way, Jacob Zuma was the chief of the intelligence service. I mentioned that previously. Um, the guy running Russia, didn't he used to run the intelligence service, Putin? So two former spy masters got together. Zuma spent six days in Russia, and a lot of people are claiming that was the basis for a deal that's going down now with a company called Ross Atom, a Russian agency that builds nuclear power plants, and they want to build a $70 billion nuclear power facility in South Africa, money South Africa doesn't have. And oh, by the way, it's a country that has its own technology that's trying to export. So when we talk about corruption, imagine the money that will come off that deal. So, But yes, their nuclear weapons program is gone. I'm totally confident that's not a threat. I, I have yes, a real short, simple question. Your first slide of- My answers are never short. Uh, this, this will be uh, Cape Town. Yes, ma'am. There's a circle of white buildings around a green area, and I wondered if those are public houses, uh, private houses, um, or government houses, the white ones. That, yeah. You talking about this here? Yeah, oh, a big ring of white, uh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Those all no, no, private? Yeah, we, we, maybe all of us, we put our money together, we might be able to buy a little efficiency apartment there. No, th those are private housing, yeah, that's, yeah. No, it's gorgeous location. Now, uh, by contrast, this area here, that's, that's the uh, soccer stadium, it's built for 2010. Not where they play rugby at, but they play soccer here. All of these are private residences, and that's the end of Africa down here, just past that point. But when you go out here, this is the main part of the metropolitan area, the center of town. If you go, I'm right there, if you go a little further this way, out into what's called the Cape Flatlands, that's where all those informal settlements are, and it's just a few kilometers from downtown. So you see incredibly wealthy next incredibly poor. Yes, sir. Okay. Hello, sir. I wanted to ask 
how great is the threat of, say, white extremist groups now, like the AWB, in, even after the death of Eugene Dari de Blanche, mm -hmm. his death in like the late 2000s? How big of a threat and how, and how violent are they in a threat to the South African democracy and what is the extent of that, as well as also extremist groups within even the black groups as well? Uh, the, the short answer to that is that uh, right extremism is zero threat to South Africa's democracy today. Uh, in 1994, uh, there were a lot of fears that the right-wing extremists uh, would um, overthrow the existing government or they would undermine the move to democracy. Um, that all kind of blew up in their face when a group of them went to what was known as Boputatswana outside of Sun City, and they tried to support or help lead an overthrow of the existing government. And it failed miserably, and you may remember images of the Mercedes where two wounded members of a right-wing Afrikaner movement were gunned down in cold blood by a policeman from that homeland. That kind of ended that threat. After that, in the middle part of the aught decade, a group of uh, right-wing white South Africans, Afrikaners, were frustrated with governance, and they formed something known as the Boromog. And the Boromog uh, was a group that uh, is kind of like a lot of um, groups in the 1960s, when you went to these, uh, these socialist groups in the 1960s, there seemed to be a lot more undercover FBI and police agents that were part of the group than were actually you know, radicals in the group. Um, the Boromog was a real threat, but it was a handful of people, and they were ham-fisted, and they were infiltrated by the National Intelligence Services, and they were all rounded up, and they're in prison now. And there is no threat from the right wing that even the South African government acknowledges are concerned about today. From the other side, there are concerns not of terrorists, but political movements. Oh, he's made a lot of controversial statements. I'm not familiar with that one, which is unusual because Zuma is actually very popular with the Afrikaners in South Africa. Because when he came to power, he reached out to Afrikaners in South Africa, went to rural communities, and said he was concerned about the farm murders. That's a topic we didn't discuss. Since 1994, there have been over 2,500 white farmers murdered in South Africa. On the right side of the aisle, many people think it's an orchestrated campaign by black nationalists or the government to murder whites. The reality is that most people who live on farms live in remote rural areas where oftentimes a shortwave radio is your only means of communication and you are vulnerable to thieves. And people assume because you're white and you're out there, you have guns and money, and so they come out and murder people. And uh, if you've been a farmer, I've been a farmer, I'm not doing it again, it's not a lot of fun. Um, but um, many of the farmers in South Africa are quite elderly. And so, you know, you can imagine uh, on a farm, you've got the payroll to pay your, your employees once a week. You went to the bank, and you come back, and a couple thugs from Johannesburg show up. They pistol whip you and lock your wife in the pantry and then beat you to death with a pistol and take your money and go for the wife. And she's clever enough to slip out the, the window and escape and go through the bush for a couple kilometers and finally find another farmhouse and seek refuge. True story happened in 2000 in South Africa. Unfortunately, it was a Norwegian couple who had moved to South Africa in retirement and opened up a disused farm and employed about 40 Zulu who were unemployed prior to that on the farm. And one of the workers wanted some money, so they murdered them, or murdered the husband. Sorry. South Africa is looking at a drought situation. Ah. What's going to happen now with the population? All right. Whoops. Oh, shoot. Can you put that back, please, for me on the last slide? Thank you. My mistake. I actually have slides on, the, on this. I, I didn't get there. The, okay, I'll, I'll jump ahead. Sorry. Your question is about the drought in South Africa. Um, you said South Africa, right? Not Cape Town, right? Good. You're, you're spot on. Um, what's the attention today is focused on Cape Town. Uh, you may have heard Day Zero. Have you heard about that? All right. You've heard about Day Zero. You guys can do a little research before you came here. So I guess I better know what I'm talking about. All right. So uh, Day Zero is what's being talked about for, for Cape Town right now. It's going to run out of water. And I'm trying to get to the slide because... There you go, right there. There's the, uh, that is Cape Town's main water supply. Cape Town's getting all the attention. Yeah, did you see my slides? You stole my thunder. No. Uh, Cape Town's getting all the attention, but the drought is not confined to Cape Town. That's where the press attention is. It's also in Durban, where the reservoirs are down to about 16% for that region, and Western, all over the Western Cape, and NMB is Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, that's where the area where um, that was named in honor of Nelson Mandela after, well, before he passed, actually. Uh, all of those places are suffering immensely. Now, whose fault is it? Is it the ANC? Is it Democratic Alliance, which rules in the Western Cape and Cape Town? 
or is it climate change? Well, it's everybody's fault. The National Party, which ruled the country, made very poor provision for fixing water supplies and provisioning water and managing water resources. The ANC, which was in power for a period of time, did very little to nothing. And the Democratic Alliance has not been very effective addressing this either. Is it climate change? Well, maybe it's climate change, but let me submit this to you. In 1911, 5 million people lived in South Africa. Today, 53 million people live there. Maybe there's too many people. Yeah, maybe. I'm just saying. No, but uh, it's a combination of things, isn't it? But yeah, um, I don't know if I answered your question, sir. Did I answer it or no? Yeah, but what's the national population? It varies from population to population. Okay. Well, this is, this is actually where I was going to crescendo all this. That's why this slide was at the end to bring it together and talk about the fragile democracy. This is the immediate case to show whether South Africa's democracy is going to work. Because in their constitution, resources like water are the responsibility of the national government, the provincial government, and local municipal governments. Many people believe, I believe incorrectly, that the ANC is ignoring the situation because, oh, it's the Democratic Alliance's problem. Let them fail in Cape Town, then we'll win the next election because they failed. They can't do that. This is too critical. So we will see if the African National Congress uses national resources to make sure that water is getting there and make sure people have access to water. Uh, the local government and the provincial government have brought online four temporary desalinization plants. It's right on the ocean. You ought to be able to take water, right? So they got four temporary desalinization plants. The South African breweries, brewery which is located there, it's been brewing beer for about 200 years, has stopped making beer, and they're just bottling water right now. Now that's going to be a drop in the bucket. Unfortunately, water use in Cape Town has dropped from, it was supposed to be 50 liters per person per day. That's rationing, but people aren't doing it. Um, they're exceeding that. The average is 79 liters per person per day. It doesn't sound like much, and it's not. Turn on your shower for a couple minutes. You're going to exceed that pretty quickly. Um, but the problem is that people are still using it. Usage is another problem here. You know, you're familiar with the term, the tragedy of the commons. So if everybody can use something, people don't take care of it, right? Right? You, know, you, go, you go to a public thing, and people don't, don't take care of it unless they have some stake in it. Public taps, which are placed in communities, and I'm not picking on these communities, but in public community, or public taps that are placed in a community where communal access to come up and turn a spigot on and get water, and you pay nothing for it, what does that lead to? Waste and abuse, intentionally or otherwise. Bless you. So I had a photo, that's right there. You see this photo right here? These are police in Cape Town who find this man right here, the equivalent of $250. Oh, that's, that's a couple months' salary for some people. $250 last week in Cape Town because he was washing cars. Went to communal tap, filled up his bucket, and went and washed cars. Well, it was water rationing. You're not allowed to do that. But guess what? Where does he make his money? Washing cars. So he's kind of in a bind. Um, this will be a test of South Africa's democracy. I think they will, they, will, they will get through it. But the question is a big question. It's all of South Africa. And, of course, bear in mind that much water is used by industry, the mines, and agriculture. There's the big consumers. So there may be 53 million people, and yes, I was a bit of a joke there. They're using a lot more water, which is true, but all those things play a role. So there has to be ways to save the money or save the water, marshal resources, and conserve it. It has to be a national campaign. There's been a lack of strategic vision on this issue for South Africa, for the United States. Uh, we're all here today, but our great-great-great-grandchildren that live in Nebraska are all going to live in a dust bowl if we keep draining water out of the Ogala Aquifier, which will be drained of prehistoric water within 100 years by watering wheat fields in Nebraska and Kansas. True story. Write a little note, put it in time capsule for your great-grandkids so they can look it up. But I'm not sure. Did I answer your question now, sir? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we know that uh, China is very interested in the natural resources of Africa in general. What is China's role in South Africa right now? Oh, you guys have some good questions. Uh, China is, has become South Africa's single largest trading partner. China last year had $20 billion of imports, exports between China and South Africa, which makes them the largest trading partner. For a long time, it was the US and, and the European Union, but now it's China. Uh, but China also has some philosophical and intellectual relationships with the older generation that still controls the ANC. It may be a political party that runs the country, but that political party is run by a handful of men. A couple women, but largely men. And those men are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and many of them got at least philosophical support from the Soviet Union or China, or went there when they were young men, and they were coming of age, and they were in the struggle. And that's where they got support from. So there are some links there. And you see it play out in crazy things like the Dalai Lama. I don't know what you all feel about the Dalai Lama, but I think he's a pretty cool guy. You know, uh, I think he's all right. I, I've never heard him say anything that was mean about anybody, or, or evil, or racist, or bigoted. 
Maybe he has, but I missed it. But the Dalai Lama has tried to go to South Africa three times in the last decade. And each time, the government of South Africa has denied his visa. Now, is the Dalai Lama a child molester or a murderer or a killer? No, he's not. Of course not. Why would he not go to South Africa? Because the government of China doesn't want him there. So the ANC, paying back their friends from China, have denied this honorable man a chance to attend an anti-racism conference sponsored by the United Nations, the 80th birthday of his close friend, Bishop Desmond Tutu, and on another occasion. And so it plays out in that respect. Um, Chinese foreign direct investment in South Africa is not that high. There's lots of other foreign investors there, but trade is on the uprise. Unfortunately for South Africans, a lot of that trade is stuff that they used to make. Before 2005, when the World, World Trade Organization's multi-fiber agreement expired, it was an artificial thing that gave countries in Southern Africa an advantage. If they brought cotton and material from other locations and assembled it one place, a third country, then they got a tax break and they could ship things without duty to the Europe and to the United States and have large quotas. As a consequence of that, Taiwanese and Chinese firms built lots of textile firms in South Africa, Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, and Mozambique. And there were hundreds of thousands of jobs tied to the textile industry. In 2000, 90% of all the clothing sold in South Africa was manufactured in South Africa. Today, barely 20% of the clothing, maybe 30%, is produced in South Africa. Why? Because the multi-fiber agreement expired, the artificial advantage of that tax break disappeared, and South Africa, like the United States and everybody else, is inundated by the scale of China. China will always be able to produce things cheaper on scale than South Africa can. Billion and a half people, 53 million people. Industrial capacity beyond imagination, small industrial capacity. So the Chinese have swamped the South African market with their goods, and that has affected them. But politically, there is a strong relationship there. It's not an alliance, but a strong relationship. Did I get the question? Uh, the world's largest coal processing facility port is located in South Africa, in Richards Bay. It can produce more coal on a single day than any other port facility on the entire planet. Uh, much of that coal used to be destined for Europe. Today, it's destined for China. Uh, but they buy it. Then it's not, they don't have any dirty deals. They're paying the same world market price everybody else is. Um, so China is a consumer. China is also a consumer of some strategic minerals like platinum and other things, but um, they buy it on the world market from the South Africans. There's no special deals. They do have special underhanded deals in other places, but not so much in South Africa. And South Africa, interestingly enough, if you follow rare earth elements, which are not really rare, it's just that their concentration is very low, so you have to, you have to mine lots more ore and you do a lot of environmental damage, digging up a lot of material to get a small amount, but they're all over the planet. But in some, there are only certain places where there's big concentrations, and big is a relative term. Uh, a few years ago, the Chinese either bought up all the existing mines around the world or some closed. We had one in California, the only one in the U.S. that shut down because environmental regulations from the EPA were putting it out of business, so they shut down because it wasn't worth it, wasn't profitable. So at one point, the Chinese controlled 99% of the world's rare earth element production. South Africa now has a rare earth element mine that is, is going in operation, and that's nothing to do with the Chinese. They did that on their own in the Karoo, that desert area I talked about. Next, sir. Sir, you mentioned that with all of the South African problems, they probably have the strongest economy of the 54 nations on the continent. Is South Africa providing some momentum or perhaps a model to emulate to other nations in Africa? To be clear, to answer your question, um, whether South Africa has the strongest economy or the most important economy or or the largest is all in contention now because Nigeria finally reassessed the value. They changed the, the indicators and using more standard ones. They've changed over time. When Nigeria last evaluated their economy, there was virtually no internet, mobile telecommunications. There are actually value-added dollars that come from those capabilities that contribute to economic output, uh, along with a number of other issues. So when Nigeria rebalanced, if you call it, their economic picture and came up with more than a doubling of their GDP, which people didn't believe, but it's, it's actually true. Their economy is huge. It's 190 million people in Nigeria, produces 2 million barrels of petroleum a day, and has a vibrant economy internally. Uh, so when they happen, a lot of people are saying that Nigeria is a more important player now. I would tell you that based on the fact that, that, that long-established wealth, uh, financial networks, banking, and also experienced by South African multinationals or large corporations in foreign direct investment, South Africa is still a major player around the continent. You go many places like Uganda and all the big shops and stores and little restaurants are brand names from South Africa. ShopRite, 
Standard Bank. Uh, you also see other things like Nando's. Anyone familiar with Nando's? Or you see KFC. Yes, I know KFC is an American brand, but the local franchise is a South African company around the continent. So South Africa does play a big role, particularly in foreign direct investment. Did I answer your question? Chris, thanks for a great presentation. Really appreciated it. So I, I want to uh, ask about the media. So you, you've painted a picture where the ANC is very corrupt. They've been in charge for 25 years. And in most examples like that, I mean, you also alluded to the meeting between Zuma and Putin. You know, in most examples where a political party has been in, in control for a long time, they put constraints, restraints on the media. Why is that I guess not been the case in South Africa. What accounts for their, their media's freedom? Well, there's a couple things here. I, I think that the, there's a personal view on this. I think that the leadership of the ANC, even Zuma, um, recognizes that there was oppression under apartheid. And they actually value more than most people realize what the world thinks of them. So they do look outside. Now, the, Zuma probably doesn't care that, you know, he's been accused of rape and, you know, it was dismissed. Uh, he takes it kind of a joke sort of thing. And the corruption he kind of dismisses. You have to understand the mindset, too, is that a lot of ANC senior officials, when they were in the struggle and they were abroad, other people were sponsoring them. They were paying for their living expenses. They gave them cars. If they were in Lusaka, Zambia during the struggle, they didn't pay for their apartment. Someone drove them where they were going. They got all these perks. When they came into power, that's how they lived. That's how they thought life was. So they expected somebody to give it to them. So some of them didn't even recognize some of this corruption. Um, so th there's a bit of tone deafness on that. But the reason they haven't really stamped out the media, it's actually a good question. I would say because the media is actually very effective and, and, and there have been lawsuits by the media, which they've won because the courts are independent. When the government has tried to silence them, they, and they've done it, the ANC at times, the ruling party, and also the opposition has tried to silence the media on a few issues. They go to court and the court upholds it under the Constitution. So the fragile democracy is something that I'm a little cautious about. Also, Jeff, let me uh, clarify something here too. I've talked about corruption a lot, but that doesn't mean the ANC itself is corrupt. I, I know that sounds weird because I've been talking about the ANC. There are people inside the ANC, and unfortunately too many people, who are corrupt or think that that's okay. There's a phrase that came out with a book written by a woman named Michaela Wrong, interesting surname, her name is Wrong, um, from Kenya. It's called, It's Our Turn to Eat. And what that means is that, you know, you people have been in, char in charge for a long time. Now we're in charge. And being in charge of the government means we get to eat. We get to take. And there's a lot of that mentality amongst a lot of people in the ANC. The party itself, I wouldn't say, is corrupt. And the reason the country has continued to flow as it is without the media being suppressed or the courts being compromised like they were in Zimbabwe, where judges retired after finding dead livestock on their front door, things like that, after they made a decision against the government. In South Africa, that hasn't happened uh, because there's a pushback. The courts have been able to stay independent, and, and, and people will take you to court. So I think that plays a big role in it. And, but the media is dogged. So speaking of the media, uh, Jeff, okay, so just a selection of things I've got here. The arms deal, entire book on the corruption. These are all printed in South Africa. A biography by Jeremy Gordon on Zuma, not very complimentary. An Inconvenient Youth, a story about Julius Malema. We didn't talk about him. He's the leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters, a leftist party that broke away from the ANC and is based large on his personality. An Inconvenient Youth. Uh, crime Wave by Johnny Steinberg, one of the most famous uh, crime statistic authors in South Africa, and one of the few people that still told us about crime when the government stopped reporting statistics. By the way, the government was taken to court over that. How can you not? You have a responsibility to be transparent to the people of this country. We need to know what the crime statistics are. So they had to start reporting it again. Now, the case was never settled. The government just started reporting again. After the Party by Andrew Feinstein. This is how the ANC grew corrupt after Mandela left office. So you can see these are published books in South Africa, which most of us have never seen because you don't have access to South African books. And if you do, you go to Amazon, and this $10 book is $850 because you have to import it. So <laughs> anyway, did I answer your question, Jeff? All right, next question, please. This is 600, not 850. Uh, you know, the South Africans have a little bit of, a, they're, they're kind of very entertaining people if you, if you look at it. Uh, I picked this up in South Africa a few years ago, and it's, uh, they're very much into political satire, and they, they have a lot of fun with that uh, political humor. Uh, this is the racist guide to the people of South Africa. <laughs> so if you're a racist, you want to learn about Indian women, you can read about it here, or white women, or Afrikaans. So they're very cheeky, as the, as the English like to say. Yes, sir. I know 
they have full diplomatic ties with the nation known as North Korea. What, what uh, have they done any productive efforts of trying to curb North Korea's nuclear program or trying to mediate between the government? And I know that because of the history of the ANC's left wing struggles, whether they lived in the Soviet Union, China, or North Korea, that they would ha house the ANC members. What do you know or not know, or what? I don't know a lot about that, but what I do know is that uh, their, their interaction with North Korea has been quite limited. Uh, there's other actors in Africa that do more with North Korea, like Uganda. Uh, for instance, <laughs> I had two NCOs working for me, non-commissioned officers, doing some training in Uganda. I went out to visit them, and I looked over about 100 yards away, there's two North Korean soldiers in Uganda. And Uganda had told us that they no longer work with the North Koreans. Somebody fibbed. Anyway, uh, but no, there's not much interaction with the South Africans. And I should give a caveat here, too, about something else. A lot of what I talk about is socialist leanings and that sort of thing. This is Wyatt's view, okay? So let me just explain this very quickly. You, you, you can't go and get statistics on this. I will tell you that, that within the ANC, fully 50% to two-thirds of the people in the party, in my view, those who I've met and what I've observed, are committed to a multiracial democracy, market-based capitalist society, but hoping to settle the, the differences amicably and, 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 and make sure that people are risen out of poverty. One third of them are died and will left this communist socialist, want to chase all the white people in the ocean and take everything. And that has been an internal conflict within the party. But largely since 1994, the ANC has mostly tacked towards the center or possibly economically center right slightly. They may have espoused things, they say comrade, and they talk about their cadres, and they have party conferences, like Soviet-style parties, but they have largely, from a macroeconomic standpoint, and from a political standpoint, been a centrist party for the most part, which has been good for South Africa, but they have allowed corruption to creep in, and they are not fixing the endemic problems with education, with services, and with corruption especially. There was a hand here. Oh, one more, okay. Yes, ma'am. Are there places in South Africa that would be appropriate cruise or vacation uh, destinations? <laughs> Good question, and, and I, I did say that it's, it's, it's a hazard doing this because it sounds like it's all bad. Let me tell you something. If I was not an American, I would never give that up for anything. But if I was born again, I guess if you're Shirley MacLaine, that happens. But, but um, okay, somebody got that reference. I'm glad. <laughs> You know, as you get older, and uh, you start to wonder if people get your cultural references. So um, some of them are locked in a period of time. But that's Shirley MacLaine. Somebody got it. So um, if I were to come back and I couldn't be American, I've got to tell you the only thing I want to be South African. It is an amazing country full of amazing people. And you want to talk about tourism. Now, I will warn you this. If you go there, you just got to be careful. You know, you got to have your spidey sense about you. You know, a little hair in the back of your neck. If something seems strange, that's because it is strange. If something seems out of place, it is out of place. They have very effective criminals there. There was a busload of Dutch tourists who left Johannesburg Airport a few weeks ago. Johannesburg Airport, they drove down the street about five miles away. They got pulled over by a police car. Except it wasn't a police car, but it looked identically like a police car. They put markings on it. They got out. They had fake uniforms on. They beat the living crap out of a few of the Dutch tourists who were in their 70s for the most part and robbed them blind. Welcome to South Africa. Uh, that said, there are world-class places. Cape Town, gorgeous, wonderful location, Table Mountain. Finally got up there after 30 years of trying to get up there. Every time I went to Cape Town, I was working. I never had a chance to go to the top of the mountain. Amazing view from up there. Hiking, I've gone zip lining, you know, and everybody can do that at any age, zip line, where you get on the cable and you slide across the canyon. You can do that all over South Africa. Wildlife, amazing wildlife. There are three places in Africa that I tell people if you want to see wild, four places if you want to go. Go to Tanzania for the Serengeti, the thousands of wildlife, go there. Go to Namibia for the Atosha Pan. Go to Botswana, because there's more elephants in Botswana than the rest of the continent combined, by the way, in Botswana. And go to South Africa. You can go to Kruger National Park, among other places. It is an amazing place. Vistas, mountains, beautiful. You can go to Durban. You go surfing there. But don't go past the shark fence, because there's great whites out there, and they do eat surfers. Um, yeah, it's an amazing place. It, it, you can, cruises, less so cruises. Uh, you can also take a train trip from, Johannes, or from Cape Town to Johannesburg on the Blue Train, a famous train that's been around for over a century, luxury cars. You see the vistas as you travel. It's, that, is, that, one's, that train's safe, okay? So that one I'll let you know about. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's an amazing place to visit. It is truly astonishing, the different types of environments from the tropical settings in Durban, where I was one day on the beach in Durban. I'm not a beach person. I hate the water. I like mountains. But I was on the beach just for the experience in Durban, got in the car in my shorts, drove up 
to the Drakensberg Mountains, about three hours away, four hours away, where it started to snow. And continue on to Johannesburg. By the time I got there, there were two inches of snow. I checked into my Holiday Inn. They do have a Holiday Inns, and they're actually quite nice in, in South Africa. And I listened to the news reports and watched TV reports about hundreds of motors stranded on the highway that I'd just driven because they're not accustomed to snow. I'm a Viking. I can handle snow, so it didn't bother me. But uh, amazing different vistas. That said, there's also a lot of dangerous crime there. So if you're aware of what's going on, you keep your spidey sense about you, you can have a wonderful visit. South Africa is an amazing place to visit. It really is. Uh, and it's just a cornucopia of people, languages, culture, and it's just vistas are just amazing. LAUGHTER